or to us, it might just yeah. be the already cut over. I have no idea. Also, okay. uh, or go ahead. We're starting. Okay. Okay, we are currently live. Uh, so first of all, welcome back. Um, if you're expecting a talk about going secure, I'm sorry, that talk got cancelled uh, due to a speaker who could not submit a talk. So I went quickly on Twitter and I found myself the best replacement I could find. So uh, I want to introduce you all to Chris Nova, who is still up after a whole day of doing stuff to join us live from America, on the side of the world, where it's currently like 5 a.m. So welcome, Nova, do your thing. Awesome. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello. I don't know if you can see me, um, but I'm assuming you can, uh, assuming everything is working right. And it feels good to be back at FOSDEM. And uh, I'm happy to say this is my first FOSDEM that I get to wear my pajamas to. So I am very much wearing my red plaid onesie uh, for the occasion. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, like Matcha so kindly said, I've been up all night with a really beautiful friend of mine. Uh, her name is Megan and, and she's here visiting me. Uh, recently we had a really sad um, thing happen to her and her family and uh, if you all just want to take a moment and send good vibes to my best friend Megan and just think about how uh, how much we love her and how important friendship is for everyone right now and that's, that's really important. Um, so anyway, uh, we were up all night having pillow talk and, and I saw on Twitter that Macho was looking for a speaker and anyway, here I am. I'm happy to be back. I was kind of disappointed. I wasn't able to, to uh, get in before the deadline. As we all know, I've been taking a, a long hiatus from public speaking for the past few months and uh, honestly, FOSDEM is probably the only conference I would have uh, wanted to speak at and well, I was lucky enough. I actually had a chance to speak. So over the past two hours, I put together a small talk over a, uh, a personal project of mine that has nothing to do with my job, but there's some interesting computer science in here. So hopefully we can talk a little bit about my silly personal projects and uh, based off of what I know about Go and, and how much I've been working in Go over the past handful of years here, uh, I've been able to uh, push my personal goals further along and actually start to bring up a project that's going to help me with something that brings me a lot of joy and, and makes me happy in my, my personal life. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And uh, I'll share a little bit more about how you can get involved if you're interested. And, and, and hopefully at the end of this, if uh, at the very least, uh, if, if all you walk away with is just the understanding of a really cool open source project that I, I really like so far, um, then I will feel like I've been successful in my, my short 30 minutes that we have here today. So, uh, good morning. If you have questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. Y'all can't see this, but I do have my IRC client pulled up on another monitor. So I'm in the uh, FOSDEM-GO uh, channel in Freenode. I'm at Chris-Nova. Um, I'm a registered user. If you want to highlight me, I should see it. And uh, if you have questions or just want to say hi, feel free to drop a line in there and um, I'll, I'll say hi back. So without further ado, let's, um, let's jump into my, my talk here. Uh, Matcha says IRC and matrix are linked. So yeah, I think everything you see in the, the, the chat in a browser will also match my IRC and, and vice versa. I'm unsure which one is the source of truth. Um, I'm assuming matrix has some sort of persistent store, but regardless, here we are. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, we'll jump into my slides. Uh, I have about seven or eight slides and I'll kind of talk through everything. And then I have a demo at the end and I'll just kind of give like a high level overview of what I've been working on and, and how um, I've been able to, uh, to kind of get some, some work done recently, which has been nice because it's kind of kept me, kept me busy and occupied while I've been uh, looking for uh, a new place to work and uh, taking some time off to, to just relax and, and try to focus on important things in life, like my health, my family, people I love. Um, so anyway, uh, let's let's jump right into it. If you haven't seen one of my talks before, uh, I'm, I, I use very advanced uh, image rendering technology that I ironically wrote in Go, uh, like most things that I write. And uh, this is all available in my public speaking repository, which here in a moment when I start my slides, you'll see in the bottom 
right corner. So we will run our statically linked binary called so my god and we will run that in the directory that we are in and uh, we'll see that I've already managed to uh, generate a go error and uh, we'll keep zooming out until my program is able to parse my slides. And there we go. And ooh, that actually let's let's not use this. Let's go to a different different terminal here. Let's try this one. Um, go uh, public speaking dex Fosdem, and let's try this. And we're almost there. I promise. Ah, there. Oh, this one's even worse. Okay, uh, we're gonna close all of this. And we're going to go straight into good old GNU bash. I should have test driven this before I started. Um, so thanks for bearing with me here. Uh, Dex Fosdem 2021. This is my public repo. So all of my Fosdem talks are here. Uh, but this one, here we go. Finally, we have my slides pulled up. Uh, this one is, is where you'll be able to see what we what we have for, for this, uh, this demo right now. Um, if you if you want to follow along in plain text, if this is a little hard on your eyes, I understand that it is uh, rendering um, in in smaller font here on my screen. So there is plain text. If you go to GitHub.com slash Chris Nova slash public dash speaking, uh, which is also written in the bottom right hand corner, and it looks like Macha just dropped a link in the chat. Uh, it's all plain text and it uses a really simple markup, so you should be follow, able to follow along quite well. Okay, so let's get to it. Um, we're going to talk about writing a Go client for this application that I found uh, through some research I was doing for a personal photography project called PhotoPrism. Uh, PhotoPrism, I had never heard of it until maybe a week or two ago. Um, it's a really successful open source tool, um, and it, it's uh, it, it's written, majority of it is in Go. There's a JavaScript front end, and you could come here on GitHub, and it's it's quite impressive. I think it has, yeah, it has over 10,000 stars on GitHub, and it ships in a Docker container, and it, it's basically like a do-it-yourself photo cloud with a, a really slick and really intuitive UI, and it's all been built on TensorFlow, so you get some really cool metrics out of out of the images, and it, it can do some some really cool AI things automatically for you, so it's pretty slick, and I'll, I'll be showing a demo of it here in a moment, and I'll be talking about how I've been able to interface with it. Uh, so how this kind of happened is um, uh, the story we're going to go on together. So at, at a high level, hi, if you don't know me, my name is Chris Nova. Uh, I'm an unemployed programmer. Uh, I've also co-authored a book. Um, we're going to be talking about writing a client in Go. I'll talk a little bit about the scope. Um, wow, a lot of people are joining IRC. Hi, everyone who's new. Uh, we're going to be talking about the structure, uh, the HTTP protocol, and how the, H the API returns HTML. And we're going to be talking majority about testing, because I think that's the interesting component here. So we'll try to skip right to that. Um, OK, so let's talk about the scope. So let me explain my, my ridiculous project to everyone um, here. Uh, so originally, uh, I had been storing my photos in uh, some sort of cloud photo store. I had Google Photos, I've tried Apple Cloud, I've, I've tried a handful of different, you know, available options out there. But but ultimately, I, I love climbing mountains. I love bringing my camera with me and taking photographs. And I wanted a good place to store all of my photos. Um, and furthermore, I wanted to be able to access this while I was on the go. I spend a lot of time sleeping and living out of my car while I'm, I'm mountain climbing. So being able to upload through like a, a cell phone connection was important to me. And I also wanted an easy way to track metrics on each of these photos and, you know, add notes, maybe mention the aperture size or, or what my current exposure was set to or, or the focal length. Uh, and those are just basically key value pairs of arbitrary data types. And uh, I looked at all this and I wanted to automate, you know, Twitter bots. Perhaps I could do like a daily tweet on my public account. Um, maybe even post some of these to, to other APIs like Instagram. And so I knew I wanted a, a Go client. And uh, after spending some time struggling with the Google Photos API, and there, there isn't really a, a good Go client out there right now, I uh, began searching for other alternatives. Uh, so here's what I looked at. Uh, I looked at using the Twitter API and basically just using Twitter as a, a database. Uh, I looked at Instagram. Uh, the problem with Twitter is it was a little too time-based and it was hard to query. The problem with Instagram is it didn't really let me upload my, my full-sized images and it would crop them. Um, and it was, it was tightly coupled with cell phone access. 
I looked at Flickr, I looked at Imgur, I looked at a ton of them. And then uh, I even looked at kind of a build it yourself solution on a couple of different options. Google Photos worked well because I could share with folks. So I knew I wanted to capture that feature. Uh, Dropbox costed money and I had never used it before. So there would be a learning curve there. Uh, GitHub seemed like it would work well, but then I'm married to the Git protocol. And then ultimately I decided to uh, run it on this ZFS server. I don't know if y'all can see behind me here on this, this rack behind me. I've got a six terabyte RAID zero ZFS server running on Arch Linux on a 510 kernel. And uh, yeah, that's been fun to install, fun to maintain, especially with the kernel modules. And uh, it's, it's working, it's working well. I use it in Kubernetes and it's a reliable persistent data store that's resiliently set up. And I just call it my homegrown uh, data store here. So that, that runs on the uh, public internet behind me. Um, I wanna be weary of time. Uh, so yeah, I looked at uh, PhotoPrism. Uh, as I was Googling for clients and Go and photos and Go and photo cloud and Go, ultimately I, I found this project called PhotoPrism. If you want to check it out, it's github.com slash PhotoPrism. The beauty of it is uh, they, they build everything in a Docker container, which to me automatically meant it was going to be easy to, to run in Kubernetes, which I'm already running. And you can go and you can read the docs here. Um, like every time I evaluate a new open source project, I usually start at the main function and start digging into the code that way. I found out it has a web server component all written in Go. It has a UI written in JavaScript for the JavaScript client. Um, and there's an internal Go library that sort of munges the, uh, what's on the file system, my ZFS store, and what's in a uh, MySQL or SQLite database that either can run in the container or in the case of my production server is running uh, just a MySQL or it's MariaDB running on my server here. Uh, Arch for your server, I see you live dangerously. Not only Arch, but a home rolled kernel on Arch with a lot of my own package management as well. Oh yeah, I live extremely dangerously and I love it for so many reasons. I should probably just give a whole talk on why I love Arch Linux and why I suggest everybody to use it. Anyway, that's, I digress. Uh, and then ultimately it was written in Go. So it was easy for me to read and I assumed it would be easy for me to consume. Um, I see people are asking a lot of questions. I will do my best to get to them at the end. I'm trying to go quick here, so bear with me. Uh, so there was one problem. There was no effing client. Uh, so I couldn't really interface with it, but I knew there was an API, so I knew it wasn't gonna be impossible for me to reverse engineer this and, and write an HTTP, HTTPS client. Um, it seemed to be exactly what I wanted and looking at the libraries, they had publicly or exported methods uh, on all their structs that, that seemed like they, they had already defined the data structure, already defined the types, and uh, I would be able to re-implement a lot of that code. You know, the famous last words, how hard could a client be? Uh, does Chris have a write-up on a Hurricane setup cluster? Uh, I, Daniel, I'll get back to you on that one. I see a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to try to get to those. Um, but I will, I, I'll be here afterwards and I'll be hanging out in the chat so we can, we can take a lot of this offline. Ha, I said it. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to write a client go. Uh, I knew that being able to access the API was going to be important and ultimately security was going to be important. Uh, people know me. They like to mess with me on the internet. I run a public facing server. That's dangerous. Uh, I've seen a lot of malicious behavior from all over the world hit some of my public IPs. And I, uh, I'm a security engineer, which kind of makes me uh, somebody that folks like to put, pick on. So I knew that was going to be a big component of this as well. Uh, and then as I started to look at the API, I found out that there's actually more problems under the hood than I had originally uh, sort of perceived or suspected. Uh, the first one was the API doesn't return JSON like you would expect it to. It just returns HTML. So even crafting a, a proper HTTP request at the proper endpoint with the proper fields that actually are valid against whatever data store you're running, yeah, you're getting more than just the JSON payload back. It's, it's not a proper JSON API endpoint. It's, it's actually returning the HTML that your browser would render. So that was an interesting uh, discovery. Um, furthermore, after looking at the code, it, it actually stores the plain text password. So I had to, well, I didn't have to, but I decided to set up a reverse Nginx proxy with TLS offloading, uh, and then that forwards to uh, a random port locally. And I've got bash scripts that sort of manage that whole infrastructure behind the scenes. Uh, I do live streams on that and I can point folks to some videos if they want to see more. And then ultimately all of the structs in the, uh, the client go were exported. So I was able to use them. And last but not least, the container though. So the container was what was important both for running and for building. Uh, if you've never tried to compile against TensorFlow, a lot of the internal libraries are written in C, which means you're doing a lot of C Go. I run Arch Linux, so naturally drift from what the uh, the code is expecting in the, the most recent package in head 
was going to be a concern. So being able to build all this and marry myself to those uh, those objects that we could link against at, at compile time were, were super important uh, to be able to build my code in the container, especially because I wanted to uh, ultimately fork PhotoPrism and make some changes that would be relevant to my use case. Okay. Uh, we're going to go over testing and then we're going to jump right into the demo and we're about halfway through my talk. Uh, so let's talk about testing. Uh, so the testing component here is, is really interesting and uh, it's not every day I get an example of a real life use case that I, I feel like is a, sort of a picture perfect use case of what I think of as using Go testing for both integration tests and unit tests um, in a production like environment that will exercise the code and the server in its entirety. And, gives you a, a really flexible way of, of running unit tests against um, a running active database server. So we're not mocking anything. If you've read my book, I hate mocking tests. They absolutely drive me crazy. Uh, I wanna actually hit an API. I wanna send an HTTP request. I wanna bombard the server. I want to try to DOS myself. I wanna uh, implement race condition testing. Like I really wanna exercise this thing end to end. And uh, we were able to do that using the, uh, the container runtime and some, uh, I'll, I'll say the word clever here, but uh, I, I'm using that word lightly, using some cleverly engineered solutions on, on my part. Um, and I do see these questions coming in the chat and I will get back to those. Uh, so yeah, so the, the first thing I wanna call out is the use of test main, and I'll show concretely what that looks like in a moment. And uh, I wanna talk about how I was able to have a persistent store uh, in the GitHub repository. So if you wanna replicate my unit tests on your end, all you have to do is check out uh, the client Go, and then you can just run the, uh, the dark Docker start and you'll get photos of me, the API. Uh, you'll be able to run the unit tests against uh, preloaded data that's already in the, uh, the, the file system. The volumes are mounted automatically and, and you're, you're able to replicate exactly what I have on my end. Uh, through per a persistent store stored in Git. So anybody could check out the repo and, and run the unit tests against a container, which was uh, really exciting for me as an engineer because I could actually easily write unit tests to um, uh, exercise uh, the client that we were working on. Okay, so I will spend maybe five to seven minutes looking at the, the UI itself and just kind of giving folks an overview of PhotoPrism. And then we're gonna look at my Go code and then I'll, I'll run the unit tests and you can see how I structured my code, how the tests are set up, and how I was uh, able to version out my, my client and uh, get, get this end-to-end uh, -end test working. And we're actually able to authenticate against uh, the server and we're able to um, uh, run some of these unit tests. So uh, let's look at my demo. So I'm gonna uh, minimize this. I will uh, show the UI first, um, which, uh, we're running here on port 8081. I'll be taking this down momentarily. And uh, if we go and we, we look at the code here in github.com slash Chris dash Nova slash client go, uh, which book is the uh, anti-mocking one referred to? Uh, that would be uh, this book here. I will paste this in the, uh, the chat there. Uh, there's a whole, there's a whole chapter on infrastructure testing, which is precisely what we're doing here in, in that book. Buy several copies for you, your friends, your friends' friends, their friends and family, their extended family, their pets. Uh, buy those copies of the book, support O'Reilly Media, and maybe I'll see uh, a few bucks from, from your purchases, which would be great for me. Uh, so anyway, let's look at our sample app here. So this is where all the persistent data is stored. Here in the Photo Prism app, you can see we have photos, we have originals, we can click on these and actually see that these are uh, photographs of, here's my uh, friend Megan's kitty Missy, who I love, who, who recently moved on to the, the giant litter box in the sky, and I love her to pieces. Um, and you can also see that uh, we have some photos of me, and uh, these are all different size, different file names, different uh, encodings, and uh, we're able to exercise our code, and you come into storage, and you're able to see we have our index DB for the SQLite database, we have config, cache, we even have a concept of albums. And the Photo Prism application is able to bring all this back together at runtime with all of the persistent storage that we have here. And if you come into the sample app and you look at our pcreate command here, uh, you can see here that we're, uh, we are enabling not safe for work uploads, so setting that to true. And you can see that our admin password is, is, is of course, uh, Missy. And uh, we're able to go and here's where we mount all of our persistent volumes. And then we just run the Photo Prism container, the latest version of it. And so looking at that in code, 
um, we can close this and we will drop in a terminal here. Um, do, 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 do. Exit out of this and here we go. And let's go to go uh, source github.com, Chris Nova, client go, sample app. And we can run our key create here uh, as sudo and it's already running. And uh, we could pull this up here and we can actually see um, what it looks like on the back end. Uh, so you log in. This is where I found some security concerns, uh, which was how the, the password is stored. And then it's basically, if you've used uh, Google Photos, you're, you're able to come through and uh, it has a concept of indexing, which uh, will sync the file system with what you have in the database and the database with what you have in the file system. And it uses TensorFlow over here on the left and you can sort your photos by date. Uh, if they have geotagging enabled, you can actually, it will populate them on a map for you. You can go through, you can heart photos, you can generate links, you can edit metadata. I mean, this is truly exactly what I was looking for from a photography perspective. And I not only that, but I was getting high resolution photos and all of this is running on my, my local server behind me. And I knew that I was able to write a client for this because there is a publicly exposed uh, endpoint here. Uh, so looking at my code, we can go here uh, in the, uh, I'll actually go ahead and do a tree so we can look at this. Um, and we'll scroll up to the top. You can see here, I copied uh, the existing code into internal. Uh, so these are all the types and the methods that the internal library uses. Uh, so I kept this as internal and these basically are just serving as reference. So my approach to building a client was to take the exported methods from here and then recraft them in the API directory here that very well could go into a PKG or package later. But for now, we just put it in the API. And then we actually created a subversion, which we call V1. And this V1 is married to the API version V1. And if we go here, we can see that this photo.go is, is now in the HTTP equivalent of what used to be photo.go in the internal library. And to, to actually look at that, we can go into API V1, photo.go, open that up in everybody's favorite text editor Emacs here. And you can see that I uh, all of this was copy pasted in from the original library. And uh, I was able to actually document the API and what it was expecting. And, and now we have a method called get photo on a V1 client. You pass pass uh, UUID. We define uh, the verb that we want to use and the, um, the endpoint. And then it sends the HTTP get request. If the ID is valid, it'll unmarshal that onto one of these preloaded structs and, and just return a photo pointer. Pretty straightforward. Um, so we're able to authenticate against the API with the username and password. We're able to exercise the API and, and we're able to run unit tests. Now let's look at those unit tests because I think this is really the, uh, the exciting bit of, of what we have here. And like I said earlier, this is a great example of how uh, I really like to do infrastructure testing. So let's go into the uh, client go directory and we're going to go into uh, the test directory. Uh, so this, I think, breaks idiomaticy and go. Uh, this whole project is under, like, don't use this in production. I'm 100% still working on this for my use case only. Um, but it is a good example here. And I will more than likely refactor this directory to go into the corresponding API v1. For now, I moved it into a, a standalone directory just to keep my, my thoughts and my brain kind of sorted as I work through the code here. So if we list the test directory, we see we have our main test.go. And if we uh, pull this up in Emacs, you can see that uh, we're able to look at a few things. So my favorite part of Go unit testing is this, this test main function here. I 100% wish I would see more of this in the code that I'm running because it gives you an opportunity to uh, handle how you want to exit, uh, handle how you want to preload your unit tests, and handle how you want to, uh, if you want to clean anything up. So we're able to take advantage of this test main. Uh, here, I created a library called sampleapp.new, which will actually run that container with all of the preloaded data. Uh, it creates the cluster and it starts listening on localhost. And then I can say, start my application. I will defer an anonymous function here. And, uh, and all this really does is, it's a commented out for right now, but it will actually call app.stop stop our application, shut down the server, uh, release all the locks on the database and, and, and quietly exit the container. And, uh, and then you see down here at the very, very bottom, we run our m.run, 
And this is the, uh, the bit of the code that will actually exercise the unit tests. And then down here at the bottom, I have synthesized a couple of happy and sad paths where we check if some condition is true. For right now, that's set to true and an example of how we would log success and how we would log failure. And, and really the, the value of this is our ability to build these little methods here, these functions here that serve as little systems that will exercise our code and we can introduce regression tests here as well. Um, but basically when I do a go test, my code will start a container, execute uh, the API against the container, and then uh, go ahead and actually send an HTTP request on the loopback interface against itself, whatever's running in a container and truly exercise our code. And we can hard code values that we, we know are stored in our sample app. Uh, so it gives us a lot of flexibility as, as test engineers to introduce uh, regressions. If you maybe, you know, there's special characters we want to test against or large photos or buffer sizes. I mean, we can, we can get really granular with this as we move forward. So I, I've been able to authenticate, I've been able to bootstrap a cluster and actually execute an HTTP request against the cluster. And if we run our code here, um, you can see that we can actually exercise our code. Uh, I'll do sudo minus e bash. And uh, here, the reason I'm doing sudo is because of Docker, um, just for sanity's sake right now. And I can just do go test uh, here and I'll go ahead and pass in minus v so we can see the ever so famous rainbow Chris Nova logger. And uh, here you go. And you can see here, we're creating our application. So it started a container. Uh, you can see here we're executing our bash script. Uh, it creates the sample app. Here's the command that it ran, docker run minus D, name photo prism, password is equal to Missy, does an import, uh, sets our go path and it runs a container. It starts the application and uh, it actually executes all of our tests down here at the very end. You can see we executed test happy and test sad after we have the API up and running. We know what port it's running on. We know it's on local host. We're able to exercise our code. Everything went as we had originally planned. We got an okay. And here we were able to use go testing against a working HTTP server, against our authentication mechanisms, against uh, a local persistent data store. And me as a Go engineer can do all of this in 0.113 seconds. So as I start to build out my client, I can be 100% sure that this client uh, is something that I want. It's something I can depend on. And it's uh, something that I would uh, potentially want to donate to the, the open source project as I flesh out more and more functionality in the client Go. So anyway, that's my 30 minute personal photography project in Go. Thanks for letting me talk at FOSDEM. Let me know if I can answer any questions. I love you all. Make sure you wash your hands. Stay classy. I will show what's my hands after this. Um, any questions in the chat, please leave them now. We still have around one minute, so type fast. Uh, the most uploaded question is, uh, do you have anything written up about how you set up your Kubernetes cluster? Uh, I, I'm working on a blog. I would say right now the best resource is my live streams. If folks want to DM me on Twitter or shoot me a, a, a whisper here in the IRC channel, I can, I can link a couple of videos. Uh, ultimately, I, I will be putting together a full-fledged tutorial on how I uh, bootstrap bare metal, everything from pixie booting to the TFTP server uh, to getting everything up and running. And then uh, we're running no or diskless nodes on Arch Linux 5.10. And all of that's going to be managed with Cube Admin and uh, Cube Admin Bootstrap with Cluster API. So it's